Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry, I'm a minute or two behind here. Um, so we're starting 1 John. Has everybody got a book for 1 John? It's the blue ones in the back. Does anybody need one? All right. Okay, so we're starting with 1 John. And uh, the introduction we have up here, and I'm going to kind of just do like I normally do and flow through the introduction a little bit. I'm just going to summarize a little bit of this. First of all, our, our author here of the epistle, the first epistle of John is John, right? Um, he's the uh, same John that, that wrote the uh, Gospel of John and that writes the other epistles of John. So this was the uh, disciple whom Jesus loved. Is that the right phrase, I believe? So not that he didn't love them all or doesn't love us all, but... Uh, just that he was special. So uh, the recipients or the intended audience of this is to, I say in just a general letter to Christians, but uh, probably more focused or at the time meant for, let me see, meant for folks in uh, throughout Asia Minor where we would consider Turkey or maybe even people in Ephesus or in those general areas, just you know, remembering where the church was starting back then. Um, the theme, the first epistle of John basically describes the nature of Christian life. Just giving us some details on that, that we might be sure to live the sort of life that God wants us to live through Christ. And then there's some notes here on the, on the theme these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Now, this is quotes from the scriptures here. These things I write to you that you may not sin. These things I have written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. These things I have written to you that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Again, there are some teachings that are incorrect, that are being shared, that John wants to address as well. And we'll mention some of this as we go. So if we look at the first question, we've kind of answered this, who is the author? And that is John the Apostle, the beloved disciple, and who were the original recipients and likely Christians in Ephesus and throughout Asia Minor, what we think of maybe as Turkey. Um, they believe it was written around the 90s A.D. And then four reasons that John stated for writing this epistle, and he gives the uh, scriptures there, and there are things that, we, that I mentioned a few minutes ago, that your joy may be full. And some, some translations say that our joy may be full. I don't think that really changes anything. That just means the author is including himself in having that joy, which makes sense to me. Uh, that you may not sin, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And then another reason that John wrote this epistle, concerning those who tried to deceive you, and there were some ideas coming to light um, that kind of, well, kind of feeds into the next question about Gnosticism and different things like that. Gnostics were people who thought they had superior knowledge and different things like that. And they had some weird beliefs, which we'll address as we get further into this. Um, what has been suggested as its twofold purpose uh, to assure Christians that they have eternal life and to counter those who deny that Jesus had come into flesh. That was one of the strange ideas they had that Jesus was not actually there physically. Somehow he was a... <laughs> odd spiritual manifestation. I, I don't understand it, but uh, that was something they were combating at the time. And then what has been suggested as its theme, eternal life is in Jesus Christ, who had come in the flesh. And then what are the main divisions as outlined above? And if we look at this, it's the word of life mentioned in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. God is light, which is covered from the first chapter into the third. And then God is love, which is covered in the third chapter into the fifth chapter. And then it concludes 
with confidence and characteristics of the child of God. So that is basically the introduction, quickly summarized so that we can actually get into it. Yes, man. What's one thing that, um, when I read through that letter, it really strikes me, I'm kind of surprised that the author didn't include it, with loving one another. It's such an emphasis on loving one another. We are going to get into that further on, though, okay. but you're right. That is a big emphasis. Loving one another is a big emphasis. And I think one of the reasons that that's a big deal to John is that Jesus stressed that so much in the last evening he really had together with the disciples, that we love one another. And that seemed to really hit home with John. And John does actually mention that, and it does show up in our further study here. It just, in the introduction, you're right, it's kind of not mentioned. So. All right. Do you have anything else on that before we get into it? Yes, Pat. Uh, I think I read somewhere that uh, John was probably the younger of all the apostles, and that possibly that's why he said he was the one that he loved because he needed more of his attention because he was the younger one. And okay. I wonder, maybe that's why he refers to us as his little children. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know who was the oldest or youngest or anything. Did you have something on that, Matt? No, I, I think I've heard in connection with that that I believe it was when they ran to the tomb to see was Jesus risen from the dead, and I, I think John got this first, as I recall, and kind of indicated maybe he's younger than Peter. Maybe he just ran faster. But, but also, if we think of of John as the also the author of Revelation, assuming at a later date he was, you know. Could have been pretty old, and yeah. so having been younger would have given him more ability to age. Yeah. So he may have been, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. I've, I've never read anything on their ages, so that's an interesting idea. So, yeah, that he could have been the youngest or one of the younger ones. And uh, we have to remember that as far as disciples go, at, at different times there were lots of disciples, but not apostles, you know, but... Uh, so they had a lot of people in, in their overall group at different times of Jesus' ministry. But let's see. Um, all right. So chapter 1, if we look at this, uh, let's see. Let's look at the first question here. What are the main points of this chapter? And the first four verses are basically the prologue talking about the word of life, which is Jesus himself. And then... The second part of the chapter, chapter one is a very small chapter. I think there's 10 verses. And uh, the second part is about fellowship with God. And it does lead into logically, remember this is all one letter. It does logically lead into what we see in chapter two. So, all right, so let's read the first four verses of first John chapter one, verses one through four. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Now, again, some translations will say that our joy may be full, just including the author with his audience. That's all. It's not really, I don't think that really changes the meaning there. If we look at question number two, then. How is John's beginning in this letter, this epistle, similar to how he begins the gospel? Yes, Pat. In the his gospel, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Right. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and who was that about? Christ Jesus. That was about Jesus. Jesus, the Christ. Jesus was with God in the beginning, right? He was always there, and that's what he's getting at here, that which was from the beginning, he's talking about the Lord, right? So, let's look at uh, question number three. How does John describe the pre-incarnation of Jesus? 
I think we kind of just answered that. If you want to. Yes, as that which was from the beginning, right? He was there. Hmm? Yes, he was there before creation. So, or he was there at creation, however you want to say that. So, that's one, uh, see. So then if we look at question four, what empirical evidence does John provide concerning the word? You know, empirical means, Physical. yes. He touched him, right? He touched him. Anything else? They saw with their own eyes. Saw with their own eyes. He's giving eyewitness testimony, right? He's giving firsthand experience. He's saying, I saw him. I heard him. I felt him. All these things. He interacted with him. He, if you think about it, all the apostles, disciples, they had, they had that firsthand knowledge and interaction with with Jesus right here on earth in the flesh. Something that we don't have, but that's what they had. Now, this is also to contrast that idea that we mentioned earlier, that some people were spreading the idea that Jesus was not here physically, that he was some sort of just spiritual manifestation. And this is to contrast that. John is saying, no, I firsthand have evidence. I am an eyewitness. I saw him. I heard him. I touched him. You know, lived with him. Yes, ma'am. You know, there are some uh, who, who claim that this wasn't written by John, the apostle. And I think these verses very much give us a clear indication that John, the apostle, was one of those who actually did. He was with yep. Jesus, and he saw him and touched him and all of these Right, and again, yeah, that's that's proof also that John is the one who authored this. I mean, you know, that is proof because he's he's given his own testimony here as an eyewitness. And uh, so it's, it's interesting to know that there were people who claimed to have superior knowledge, yet they weren't this eyewitness like John and the other apostles are. They were claiming to have superior knowledge, and they were actually teaching incorrectly and that's some of the things that John is addressing here in this letter. So just as a bit of a preamble as we get into this, that's kind of the reason he's bringing up some of these things. Yes? It's interesting that in verse 1, they portray, Jesus portrays the word of life. And in verse 2, the life appeared. This presence, this life, is so much more than Right. He's referring to Jesus as this life that appeared that was eternal, right? He had the blessing of seeing him, hearing him, touching him. He saw all these things. He is still living and sharing that he was able to um, have that experience. Yes. Yes, and he is he is sharing that firsthand knowledge of, of the Lord that way. Yes. I the verse that might go with that too is uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Okay. Insomuch as many have taken into hand and set in order a narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us. In verse 2. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word yep. delivered them to us. Right. Luke also giving a, giving a testimony of eyewitnesses, right? He wasn't personally an eyewitness, is that correct, I think? But he uh, is giving testimony based on eyewitness accounts. So, and that does go with that again. Well, you know, it doesn't say he was an eyewitness, does it? Just as those who, from the beginning, were eyewitnesses. Right, I'm not saying he was an eyewitness. I'm saying he is giving testimony based on eyewitnesses that was given to him. I, I don't know that he was actually there in the presence. I, I just know what he writes there. It's like he's saying, I'm giving this account from eyewitness testimony. That's probably the best way I know to say it. If I say it incorrectly, you can yeah, let me know. Historian, he, yeah, he's he, kind he, of he giving... people, and, yeah. and he 
he would, of course, accompany Paul. And right. And all of that and the Holy Spirit. We have a, a and that's another thing. He was with Paul a lot, so. And he made sure every little detail, which the others might not have given, Luke gave a lot of detail in his testimony about Christ and about the church. Right. Luke, Luke gives a lot of detail on different things. And I think that's one of the good things about the Gospels is that they're not strictly identical to one another. They have different varying perspectives and things that kind of helps. And it kind of co corroborates them better than if they were identical accounts, then that would be suspicious. Yes? Well, and like a lot of the detail that Luke brings out about Mary and the conversations with Elizabeth and all that, you know, it's, it's not much of an imagination to guess that he interviewed Mary. He probably talked to Mary and got some of that information, which is why he has it. That would yeah, make sense. The Holy Spirit guided him and all that as well, but he yeah. apparently talked to people. Right. So Luke was, yeah, he was talking to people and getting the, gathering that eyewitness testimony to these things. Yes. Is this author, John, is he the one who Jesus said on the cross, you know, take, take Mary? To my understanding, this is the John that he said, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. And that's, you know, that's my understanding, yes. So, okay. Um, so that was about the empirical evidence, right? Right, okay. So if we look at question five, we're in, we're in 1 John, we're looking at chapter one. Okay, and if we're looking, do y'all have a book for this? Do y'all have one of the blue books from the back? Yeah, Okay, all right, so um, if we look at question five on chapter one, what does John declare? Now, there's three questions here, so I'm just going to take each piece at a time. What does he declare? And this is kind of an odd answer, almost like a trick question, but it's just the way it's phrased. Well, he does declare that, but that's not what they're going for. That's why I said, okay. The, the, the thing is, he declares, if we look at verse uh, 2, he says, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was mad. He's declaring eternal life, but in this case, he's referring to the eternal life of Jesus the Lord, right? He's declaring this eternal life, that which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So he's talking about the Lord Jesus here in this instance. Huh? The question says verse 5, so that's what I was going on. The question says, yeah, you may be looking at uh, question six. I am. Yeah, we're on question five. I'm sorry. If I misspoke, I'm sorry. Yeah, otherwise, you may have just looked down one by accident. It happens. Uh, so anyway, so he's referring to Jesus that way. And if you'll think about that, one of the reasons he's referring to Jesus, because what's our eternal life based out of, or who is our eternal life based out of? But Jesus, right? So we would not have eternal life without Jesus. So um, so I thought that was interesting. That's another reason I wanted to take these like a piece at a time. But then the second part of question five was, what does he want to share? What does John want to share? And this is a little more vague, too, that he's trying to share. No. I'm sorry, again, this just has to do with the, with the questions that the person was, the fellowship, right. He's trying to share the fellowship um, with the father and his son. He's trying to share fellowship with these people and also his audience, which would also include us, and with the father and the son. So I'm sorry, that, like I said, those questions may be a little, but if you look at those verses, you can figure it out. Uh, but you have to look at those exact verses two through four. And then finally, well, <clears throat> pardon me, finally, why does he write? And he gives you that in verse four at the end where it says that your joy or some, some of them say our joy may be full, right? So, so that everyone's joy will be full in believing in Christ and having fellowship with God and with each other. Does anybody have anything else on that before we do move on to the next verses? 
All right. So we're going to look at 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So with that, if we look at question six, what message has John heard that he now declares to us? And this goes back to her answer a few minutes ago, right? That God is light, right? And there is no darkness in him at all. God is pure, right? So God is pure and he is light and there is no darkness in him. So um, who would be or what would be the darkness then? We think of the darkness as being evil, Satan, whatever is opposed to God, right? Because God is the light. And who delivered this message to John? Because he's talking about a message that was delivered to him that he's sharing. Hmm? The Spirit? Jesus, the Spirit? I don't I don't disagree if you say the Spirit, but I was taking it as a more personal thing that Jesus had actually delivered this message to them. That was part of where he spent time with the Lord and they were, you know, Jesus was teaching them. So so I was taking that as a reference to a direct, you know, teaching of the Lord to him. That's that's what I was thinking. But that's okay. Yes. That might be part part of his argument against these folks who are like, well, Jesus was just a, a ghost and he wasn't even a real person. <laughs> like he's making he's like, I saw him, I touched him, like we just talked about. Now he's like, I got this message from him because I was there. It really happened. That's what I was thinking. That it, yeah, he's this is all part of that proof against those folks who were saying that Jesus was not physically here. And he's like, I got this message from him. I have all this proof that he was here, that he taught us, that he was here physically, you know. But yeah, he is still trying to go against these folks, and we're going to get into some of that because they had some other things they were sharing that were incorrect. So if we look at question seven, if we say we have fellowship with God but walk in darkness, what are we? Wrong. <laughs> yeah, we are wrong, yes. I mean, basically... Uh, we're wrong. It says liars, right? Oh, did you have something, Matt? Yeah, liars. Liars who do not practice the truth. So, um, and then who who do we follow when we lie? The devil. Right. We're following the wrong one. Whether it's through deceit or whatever, maybe we're deceived in some manner, but nonetheless, it's still still following the wrong one. Yes. In Romans three twenty three. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right. Yeah, Paul says that there in Romans 3, that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's right. And John is really, I mean, if you think about it, this is just another corroboration of that. He's backing that up. So, if we look at question 8, what do we enjoy as we walk in the light together with God? Fellowship with the Lord, Fellowship with the Lord right? What else? Yes, Matt. The blood of Christ, which cleanses us from all sins, so we're walking in God and we're having that as part of, like 
almost to every breed from the water we swim in or whatever. Right. It's just, it's supposed to be just a natural part of our lives that we have the cleansing of all sin by the blood of Christ. Yes. Okay. It goes back to it, that verse 4 where it says, we all should be filled with joy because of all of this. Right. Yeah. We should be, we should be filled with joy because we are forgiven. Right. Definitely. That, that, that's a part of our joy that we are cleansed. All right, so if we look at question number nine, what if we say that we have no sin? It says, uh, let's see. We deceive ourselves. I mean, we are deceiving ourselves. It says in verse eight, we deceive ourselves, right? And the truth is not in us. And they had part of this in these verses here. They, they had people who were claiming that they were living perfect, sinless lives, and he was refuting this, that we are treated and accepted as sinless only because of the Lord, not because we are truly living perfectly sinless lives. Yes? It also says it makes him a liar because he's saying that we did sin. Right. Yeah, that's in verse 10. If you come down, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And that we know that can't be true. So he can't be a liar. It kind of makes a mockery of the whole sacrifice of Christ. And that was the whole point was that we were sinners and he needed to be our atonement. But if we're like, oh, no, we have no sin, you're sort of spitting in Christ's face. Like, yeah, you're saying you don't need... <laughs> You're saying you don't need his sacrifice if you say we're living a perfect, sinless life, right? Then you're saying, we didn't need you, you didn't need to do that, and that's that's totally wrong. Yes? And many people in the culture we live in today, they believe they're not doing anything wrong. Don't tell me what I'm doing is wrong. I can do what I want. You do you, I'll do me. Don't tell me, don't profile to me. And in that, we see that Satan has succeeded in his mission. To deceive and lie and keep people um, Yeah, we we see that in the out in the culture and society where people are deceived into believing anything they do is perfectly okay, they can justify whatever they're doing and that that's all right, they are that far deceived. And some of those things we just shake our heads at. It's like how can people believe that's okay? But they, they do. Yes. And I think part of the fault is the preachers in the world preaching this watered down stuff that God is love and you never say that what you did is wrong. Right, because they misunderstand. Yeah, there are people who preach that God is love to the extent, and this isn't really love, to the extent that you can just do whatever you want and it's okay. And that is not correct because real love will correct you and teach you properly. And sometimes that hurts. But that's that's real love. Real love is when you teach your child, no, you can't run out in the road. Um, you know, you keep them safe, and you sometimes that means maybe they get punished for doing something wrong. But that's real love. Yes. And, and depending on how we say these things to, to those in the world, we can portray ourselves as well. We're we're people of God, and we're perfect, and you're not. And you need to change. And, and missing the point that no, we're not. We're not perfect. We're covered by the blood of Christ, and come receive the gift too. Right. And that right. self righteousness can push people away because you know. That's yeah. Not how it is. And we do have to watch out for self righteousness too, because that's another thing that these people were doing. They're puffing themselves up, saying they're living a perfect, sinless life, being self righteous, and we have to be careful of that as well, because really the only difference between us and anybody else out on the street or anywhere else is just we have the Lord. We know the Lord. Without him, I would be exactly like any of these other people. So, I mean, that's just the way it is. So, if we look at question 10 on this chapter here, this is our last question for chapter 1. What's required to be forgiven of sin? and cleansed of all unrighteousness. Wickedness, 
We confess our sins, right? In verse 9, we confess our sins. And this is, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? And this is just good practical teaching that we are, like, to go along with what Matt was saying, that we are not sinless, we are forgiven. Actually, you go along with all that John is saying here, we are not without sin, we are forgiven. We are forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Christ. So we have no reason to be self-righteous. We still needed that same payment. Yes? So I feel like there's a tension in this, these verses here. Maybe it's, it poses a question. Uh, verse 6, we're told, you know, if we, have, if we say we have fellowship in while we walk in darkness. So there's walking in darkness is one thing. But then there's also having sin, you know. We say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So there's a sense in which we have sin, and we're covered by the blood of Christ, but we ought not to be walking in darkness. And so I, I that didn't make that into a good question. <laughs> you know, maybe that's a thought question. What's the difference between walking in darkness? Well, here I, I took this, where he's talking about darkness here now. I was thinking of it as I was reading this and everything as having all to do with these people who are deceived into thinking that they have no sin, that they, you know, they're, like I said, they're, they're saying they're self-righteous, living sinless lives, and that's a, because that's a, a lie, that's a form of darkness. And, uh, but that's the way I was looking at it. I was looking at this all being in reference to those folks who were teaching that and believing that, but. Um, because he says walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth and the truth is that we do have we do have sin in our lives and that we're not perfect in living sinless lives that's what I was thinking of it as but you're right maybe there's more to that there I kind of think of it as walking in darkness is you're, you're just completely doing all that that's, your life is characterized by doing whatever I want to do Versus as Christians, we're trying to follow Christ. We're going to do it imperfectly, and we'll confess our sins and be covered by the, by the blood of Christ. But, but that's different than walking in darkness. Right. Yeah, and I, I was just thinking they were deceived. You know, in darkness, blind, you can't see because you're deceived. But, but yeah, I understand. Um, yeah, if you're walking in darkness, that is, I guess, I guess there's more than one way to walk in darkness, right? I mean... If we're just doing what we want to do, and that's what we insist on doing regardless. Did you have something, Pat? Yeah, I was going to say, is he talking to Christians? Yes, he's talking to Christians. So they're supposed to know the difference, right? Yep, we should know the difference, right? Yeah, so that's right. That's right. We have to remember his audience. He is talking to Christians, and they should know the difference. And he's also trying to warn them against believing these, these incorrect things. So... So our time is up this morning, unless anybody has anything else. All right. So I want to thank you all for your time and your attention. Appreciate it.